Hello, Crystal Ponies! My name is Skybolt. I'm the writer and lyricist for Moonrise, a symphonic metal opera, and Fall of an Empire. This video is a bit of a behind-the-scenes making of kind of thing. It's the story of these musical works from my perspective, talking about how I got mixed up with the incredible symphonic metal composer, who needs no introduction, the L-Train. For anyone watching this who doesn't know much about me, I got into this crazy fandom right before Season 2, which feels like such a long time ago now that I think about it. After getting slowly immersed into all the creative horse culture, I decided to start doing some kind of musical stuff myself. So I began making pony parodies of other songs, just as a way to sing and do some writing of my own. I've been a big fan of Weird Al Yankovic's work for years and really modeled a lot of my earlier stuff off of him. That's your pony scope for today. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's your pony scope for today. But besides the art of parody, or in my case, ponification, I've always been a big fan of musicals. Being a 90s child, I grew up with musicals like The Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and everything in between. I also benefited from having a lot of musical and dramatic influences in my own family, so it created a hodgepodge of interest for me. I mean, heck, the musical stuff is what really cemented me into liking this crazy show made for little girls. I had all the songs stuck in my head after binge-watching season one. I was still singing Winter Wrap-Up, At the Gala, and the whole assortment of rarity songs for months afterwards. So naturally, when the first brony musicians started producing music like that, I was into it. As were many others. In particular, I thought The Moon Rises was great, and wanted to cover it myself. Which is when another cover popped up from this strange Australian musician. I'd already heard of the L Train when he did his symphonic metal tribute to My Little Pony, so when his Moon Rises metal cover popped up in my subscription box, I knew I had to make use of that instrumental. He noticed that I covered it and commented, which looking back still blows me away. In no other circumstance did I ever imagine bumping into someone from Australia online and end up collaborating on two symphonic metal operas. Friendship is magic, but the internet definitely helps. So when months later he started putting together the team for Moonrise, I knew I had to audition. I love symphonic metal in general, but this was an opportunity to do something really musical too. So I put together the best lyrical resume I could with a bunch of links to different songs I had rewritten, including one I'm still quite proud of, which is Lament for Queen Chrysalis. Oh, till I heard your scream and flew off to the scene and find you laying sick on the floor. I thought that song showed off my writing abilities more than anything at that time. I took Ponyphonic's Lullaby for a Princess and completely rewrote it from a male perspective, telling my own story about the origins of our favorite insect queen, which gave me an excuse to sing it too. Luckily, the L-Train returned my email and sent me a test song, which eventually became Lunar March. After that, I did a second test song, which eventually became Harmony. After submitting the second song, I didn't even know if I was chosen or not. I remember sending another email to pretty much just ask, Please let me know when you make your decision. Thank you. By that point, things were already decided, and he told me that I was selected. Thank goodness. And really, Lunar March and Harmony didn't change much from those original versions. Keeping that momentum going, I was picturing it like we were writing a full musical episode, something like the Season 3 Closer. 
However, it isn't like one of those episodes in a very important way. That's one reason it's called an opera, besides sounding cool. <laughs> I think of it like a spectrum. A play is all talking, dialogue, and monologues. A musical is a little of both, like most things you would think of from the genre. They sing and have big musical numbers, but they also have basic conversation and dramatic sections. Then, as in our case, an opera is all singing. That's how I think of it anyway. Some people called Moonrise a song, which I don't really get. It's seven different scenes, as we called them. If I were to use the word song, I'd apply it to the individual scenes, a seven-song opera. But the fact that it's a larger work kind of muddles things, especially for people who come from the more metal side of the spectrum. The prelude, scene one, is basically an overture. It covers some of the main musical motifs of the other scenes, so it shares melodies with those other scenes, but... That's the nature of the genre. It's like any other musical which features reprises and callbacks to past numbers to remind the audience of a certain emotion or dramatic setup. That gets used quite a bit in Fall of an Empire especially. Crossroads of Life and Heavy as the Crown come back several times to emphasize a scene. That's one thing that was so cool working on these. They were big productions, as professional as we could make them. Some of my favorite comments are the ones that say, I'm not a brony, I'm not really into the pony thing, but this is really good. That's definitely one reaction I was really hoping for. I didn't want this to be confined to just bronies, I wanted it to be something people could share out there, like those Disney musicals. I wanted it to be enjoyable to everyone. So for all the songs in both Moonrise and Fall of an Empire, I put my 100% into all the lyrics I wrote. Moonrise was a great test in a lot of ways. It was a fairly straightforward story for me to apply relatively basic writing structure to, then expand on it in subtle but significant ways. Harmony, the first full scene, sets up the world for what it is. It was during a time of harmony. The princesses had ruled the kingdom for a while and brought about a new age of peace and order after a time of great division. They weren't divided up between earth ponies, pegasi, and unicorns anymore. They were no longer constantly fighting in ways that could rouse the spirits of an eternal winter. In the canonicity of the operas anyway, this is very important. Hearthswarming is one of the biggest story linchpins in the series. It's the inciting action, the thing that sets everything in Moonrise and Fall of an Empire into motion. But I'll get into that more later. Nightfall shows, in the clearest terms, how much loneliness can really break someone. They, we, are social beings. Luna and Celestia are already set apart from all the others, because at this time in our story, they are the only two alicorns on Earth. In a lot of ways, they really only have each other. And that makes things even harder when they only share sunrise and sunset together. In a lot of ways, they live in separate worlds, and really only have contact when those worlds transition. Someone must always be leading, one over the day, and one over the night. The fact that so many choose to live in the daytime would have a long-term effect on Luna, even with a small group of bat ponies or nocturnal creatures as friends. Time can feel like a weight pressing down on your shoulders. So, because of who they are, Luna's loneliness, her isolation, her depression, all those dark thoughts she was harboring, took over. They consumed her completely, and she gives herself a new identity to match this darkness, this split personality that's enveloped her. Celestia only realizes this too late after the change has already happened, once the damage has been done. That is what happens in Lunar March. She pleads with Luna, tries to reason with her, tries to reach out to her with love and kindness, but it doesn't work. And in scene five, they battle. Moonrise is all about Celestia having to make a choice to save her ponies, her kingdom, and the fragile lives she is trying to protect. But unlike all the foes that she's faced in the past, this time it's her own sister whom she must defeat. And so she does, but she couldn't kill her. She wouldn't kill her, because of how much she blames herself for not seeing the signs. 
so she seals Luna away in the moon, delaying the battle for another time. A time when, hopefully, another will be able to wash away the darkness and the pain. Daybreak is about that emotion. It's the moment after she's made that choice, after isolation and loneliness drove Luna into such a frayed state. A thousand-year imprisonment in isolation is possibly worse than death. But she does not have time to dwell, does not have time to mourn, for she has a duty to her people and must put the kingdom back together first. That is what Harmony Restored is all about. Because Harmony will never happen in a perfect world, because there isn't a perfect world, Harmony is doing your best to achieve it. So, those were my thoughts when writing Moonrise, the emotions I hoped those listening would resonate with. And I'm talking about the words, of course. I'm not at all taking away from the grandeur and brilliance of the L-Train's music. As I've said in the past, music is the raw emotion. It takes a certain kind of talent to translate that raw emotion into a vibrant collection of mathematics and sound, to evoke those feelings in its listeners. That's why all the classical works are still popular today, why Bach and Mozart and Beethoven have stood the test of time, because they knew how to literally play your heartstrings like few ever could. Lyrics, in my opinion, are what translate all those raw feelings in a way that the brain can understand. Lyrics take those melodies and use them to tell a story in a way that is so essential to humanity. Since before we even had written language, humanity has passed along its stories through their voices, through music and songs. That is why I think musicals, more than anything, can resonate with people of all ages. It's why Disney movies that are over 50 years old are still being watched and enjoyed by all ages today. And it is definitely one of the reasons why My Little Pony, a piece of grade-A nostalgia from the 1980s, has developed a worldwide following of so many more beyond the target demographic. Getting a chance to be part of something like that, to write a musical adaptation in the spirit of something so unusual that has inspired so much creativity, was a real honor. It was so, so much fun to do. <laughs> but um, it was also challenging, too, because Moonrise was going into production right as I was finishing up my last semester of university. So after school and work, I do my engineering homework, finish studying for my tests, then work on the lyrics between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., which looking back is quite appropriate that I wrote most of it during the midnight hours. But it was all worth it. Finally hearing the finished opera and seeing how well it was received by everyone was so cool, and I was so happy to have been a part of it. I could do stuff like this for the rest of my life. Even if I could never make it my day job, it's the kind of hobby I would never stop doing. But sometimes life does get busy enough where you have to put things on hold. After Moonrise released in February, I moved across the country only four weeks later. I got a new job in Virginia, and the moving process took way more time and energy than I would have expected. The timing worked out, though, because after it released, the L train needed to catch up on other projects and commissions himself. So it was a good break for the both of us. Although we had already talked about doing something else down the road. Then, after a few months, we both felt recharged and started talking about the next big thing. Now, we had tossed around a few ideas for what the new symphonic metal opera could be about, but there hadn't been a decision at all. In fact, the leading idea for some time was a little... different. Focusing on an MLP character that you might not have expected. We talked about a whole bunch of ways we could arrange it to make it work, but in the end it ended up getting shelved. It did have some potential though, so who knows what'll happen down the road. Like I said, I could do this forever. I love this kind of stuff. But after that idea was set aside, I saw an opportunity that I had to take advantage of. You see, I started doing brony music right before Season 3 started. Literally, the second song I ever posted was called Season Startup, which was a sort of laundry list of things I wanted to see happen in that season. So despite being the dwarf in the family, Season 3 still has a special place in my heart. 
That opener also caused a lot of waves when it came out. I'm not sure how many people remember this, but at the time it felt a lot like the Dark Knight Returns of the series. The opening villain of Season 2 was our lovable hodgepodge Lord of Chaos, Discord, and he was such a good character, with such a great actor breathing life into him, that really nothing was going to compete. When Sombra appeared, he was almost the polar opposite of Discord. Discord was an agent of anarchy for the simple fact that he thought it was fun. It was how he wanted the world to be. I think he's designed to be like Loki in that way, a necessary evil. But just like Loki, or the Joker, he is such a mischievous and compelling character that people tend to like him more than most of the heroes. But I think that's one thing that made Sombra's portrayal even better. He was the opposite. He wasn't a personality doing things just because. He was a shadowy, distant figure, a slow, imposing force wearing down the soul of the Empire from the outside. He's not acting randomly. He has an express goal in mind, an end he's trying to achieve. He wanted to enslave the Crystal Empire all over again and rule them with an iron gauntlet. You all know the canon story, but the portrayal of events in the episode left me... curious. Everything about it seemed veiled to me. At first was the fact that Luna, after not really appearing for most of the past two seasons, suddenly had a very significant part in the opening dialogues with Twilight, and most of her characterizations were nonverbal glowering. All my takeaways from that episode became the cornerstone of the elaborate symphonic metal headcanon that it's become. Now, the in-universe explanation for all of this would be Luna judging Twilight because she's about to get tested for her upcoming princess status. You know, in the episode where she gets blown into a million pieces and f***ing dies. But Luna should not be the one glowering, at least in my opinion. She should have been the one completely sided with Twilight, the one confident in her abilities. She would have said something like, Yes, sister, she can do it. Did she not save me from the nightmare moon I'd become? Then there's the crystal ponies who seem unusually tired and lethargic, having lost the crystal heart that gave them all their spirit and strength. Now, after setting aside all the Breaking Bad jokes I was thinking of, it made me think, what if there were more to their state than just missing their cosmic love battery? Even the Season 6 episode portrays things in reverse, that the Crystal Heart gains its magic from the citizens. So, yes, their national trinket got restored, but I don't think it gave them back their power so much as it represented a symbol of them taking back control of their homeland. The heart itself is just an amulet, a focusing lens, so they can shoot all their Care Bear love magic at it, like the Death Star lasers, and vaporize King Sombra from the inside out. Then, after all of that has happened, there's this interesting scene with Luna and Celestia. Like, what? These are not teachers marking down a student's report card. Something very personal was going on there. At least, in my opinion. So, that gave birth to my interpretation and the preceding backstory. Then I asked myself, why would they seem so relieved by the banishment of the Shadow, besides being happy that Twilight was again doing their job for them? So I wondered, what if Sombra wasn't dead? What if this Shadow, this thing, had just taken his place? The story talks about the Empire just popping back into existence. Then, this Shadow Sombra came back in some kind of different or delayed way because it gave Shining Armor and Cadence enough time to set up shop in their fancy new castle. So what if the real Sombra came back sometime even later? Eventually, he reappeared in his true original form. I think this theory has some merit because Sombra is one of the few villains that seems to be straight up killed by the end of the story. That doesn't exactly mesh with the themes of friendship and magic, especially when just a few episodes later, all of them begin the process of reforming Discord. So, to explore the idea more, I ended up doing a musical rewrite of I See the Light from Tangled. I wrote it with my friend Moonzy, who sang the part of Luna. That's when I started forming this whole backstory idea that I wanted to explore musically, of course. 
The Tangled parody is now, in a lot of ways, like an afterword or an end credit scene for Fall of an Empire. Right after Moonsy and I released that, I wanted to develop that story using songs from The Phantom of the Opera. I had a whole track list in mind of how I would choose music from the famous work by Andrew Lloyd Webber and repurpose them with my own lyrics and singing and everything. That was over three years ago. Because of college and stuff, I ended up shelving that idea, but now I'm so glad that I did. When the L Train and I started seriously talking sequels, King Sombrick became the number one choice to develop an opera for. Because he had so little on-screen development, my thoughts had already run wild with all the stuff we could do with him. With all of them. So I presented the idea to the L Train, and luckily, he liked it as well. I know they ended up doing some kind of Sombra and Celestia story in the comics, but that was a long time after I had this idea, and I didn't even read the comic story anyway. Plus, I liked my idea better. Not only that, but Fall of an Empire was meant to be much bigger and better right from the get-go. I was ready to do another 25-minute, seven-song piece. That's how my original Phantom parody would have ended up also. But it was the L-Train's idea to go for it, have at least ten full songs and possibly some interludes to bridge certain pieces together. Moonrise was basically an adaptation from a story perspective, but Fall of an Empire gave me a chance to do something much more original, and I cannot thank the L-Train enough for that. So we laid out the story, arranged all the main pieces on an outline, and started production at the end of October 2014. As people have noticed, there were quite a few nods and influences from Phantom of the Opera in Fall of an Empire. Besides some thematic similarities, I was linking a bunch of different songs to the L-Train for musical ideas. Regents of the Darkness especially had influences from Point of No Return and Why So Silent. Why so silent, good monsieur? Did you think that I had left you for good? Have you missed me, good messieurs? I have written you an opera. And all before the regents of the Blessing has its cost Though I bear its every weight I will face this queen's accost Will be forced to separate and face her wishes handed down as fate. Then there's the more subtle stuff like the use of the organ in Kingdoms Divided.
Then, because the story had grown beyond my humble parody, I pulled in ideas from some of my other favorite musicals, too. The Hunchback of Notre Dame contributed a few melodic ideas. Then there's The Calling. It was our Song of the Slaves, so naturally I pulled a few ideas from Deliver Us from The Prince of Egypt. All of these ideas pulled together and we were able to make something wonderful and new. We spent a good amount of time laying out that outline and really hashed out the details and plot points. Because of that, we were able to do all the songs basically in chronological order. So the prologue was the first song written, which really helped establish the foundation that we would build off of. As the storyteller, yours truly, explains, this is a time of peace, of harmony. In some ways, Fall of an Empire occurs inside of Moonrise as a timeline, because in Moonrise, the song harmony represents an age, an era of possibly hundreds of years of the world coming together in peace. Like I mentioned earlier, heartwarming is a major inciting action in this universe. Let me explain. I think it's pretty safe to say that their world functions a lot like the world in Greek mythology. I mean, heck, My Little Pony has already mentioned the existence of Tartarus, Cerberus, Manicors, Minotaurs, Griffins, and a whole bunch of other creatures that come right out of that mythology. I believe that there is a similar pantheon, a uh, Mount Olympus, in their world too. There are godlike beings, like Discord, who function in their own ways over their own domains. So what if there was a large stretch of time between where the gods left the mortal world to their own devices? Maybe these gods, these alicorns and other beings, all used to be mortal too, but they transcended their forms through the use of great magical achievement. Let's say this mythical plane of the alicorns separated from the mortal world. They did their eternal god thing while letting the other mortals continue on in their everyday lives. Maybe they even watched the mortals on creepy floating televisions. Talk about reality TV. But even though they lived on this ethereal plane, they still have some vested interests in the world below, at the very least so they can keep their TV shows going. So when the mortals are separated out into the three main races, Earth Ponies, Unicorns, and Pegasi, things are okay for a while in a feudalism sort of way. But that couldn't last forever, and we eventually get a full-on war between the three kingdoms. Their disharmony, the bad feelings they foster, are attracting a whole cadre of other beings that are destroying the world below them. Specifically, the Wendigos, who will cover the world in an eternal blizzard if they do not end their fighting. 
Emotions are tied very heavily into magic and life force, so that level of instability will probably start affecting the gods too. This drives them to interfere once again in the mortal world. The fact that the United Equestria already had a flag showing alicorns on it was proof they had some knowledge of their existence, in a legendary sense at the very least. So what if the gods, the Council of Alicorns, decided they needed to send some of their own back down into the mortal world to maintain that peace and harmony so that they don't fall apart again? I think they would have sent Celestia and Luna down to do just that. The two of them would embody the legendary beings of the night and the day that the equestrians had already shaped for themselves. The ponies were now theirs to protect. It was their divine duty. They would maintain that state of harmony throughout the kingdom. Then, eventually, they would want to spread that to all the rest of the world. This would involve forming alliances with other nations and kingdoms, which is where the Crystal Empire comes into play. Equestria was specifically formed out of three separate governments, but there were other places in the world. This is where my love of Game of Thrones starts to seep into the picture. I pictured the Crystal Empire a lot like Winterfell in the north. They are a hardy, fiercely industrious civilization. They forge their home on the edges of the world and have created generations of pride in maintaining it. But eventually they too are approached by the princesses to create a treaty, an alliance, a means of assured peace between the two of them. I think this is what drove Celestia's mindset. She is the guardian of the day, the older sister, the leader, the more powerful of the two. She takes even more of the responsibility on her shoulders. It has become her job to care for the entirety of the mortal world and keep the evils at bay. I think a lot of this drive, this determination, could have been created after other battles they had. Maybe when they first appeared in the world, there were other villains that had to be defeated. Maybe some of those battles really took their toll on Celestia. Because of them, she is now obsessed, guilt-ridden, to the point where she is deathly afraid to be a failure, to let the mortal world slip away. But, perhaps that's a story for another time. So with Celestia's self-imposed blinders, her focus is on her work, on her sovereign duty above all else. And I think Luna is the ultimate casualty of that duty. In Celestia's royal diplomatic discussions with King Sombra, and representatives from other nations like Saddle Arabia, the Zebra Nation, the Buffaloes, the Griffins, she doesn't notice her own sister. To Luna, Celestia was her whole world. She was the guiding force in a place that they hadn't been before, a place that they now had to take full responsibility of and forget about their old home. While that might have worked out for a while, the constant battles they must fight and the very nature of the roles they must fill would cause a distancing between them. They are literally day and night. I think to fill those emotional gaps, Luna would make the choice, whether intentional or subconscious, to become more worldly. While Celestia marches on, bearing the standard of their divine mission, Luna would slowly trail behind. Instead, she might find friendship with a mortal, someone who comes closest to being her peer, King Sombra. He is strong. He comes from a group who have built their culture on fighting and holding themselves against all things the world might throw at them. Through all the pain and strife, they eventually find each other. Coming from the north, day and night aren't as cut and dry. You have a month of nothing but night, and a month of nothing but daylight. Just like many other things, there's a certain flexibility. A certain amount Luna hopes she can bend the divine rules that hold her to her duty. So when they found themselves on these crossroads of life, they choose to be together. But even that symbolism, crossroads, is foreboding, a warning of things to come. They might meet and come together for a certain period of time, but the roads will soon drift further and further apart. They might meet up again, they might eventually merge together, combining into a single life journey that would travel as far as it could, but that's not what Fall of an Empire is about. It is about this crossing, this specific point in time, a milestone in Luna and Celestia's relationship that would have ripple effects for years to come. 
In Welcome to the Empire, Celestia finally sees the spark in Luna's eye, those seeds of attraction and longing for Sombra. That is when Celestia decides to intervene. But her eyes have opened far too late. She should have removed her blinders years ago to truly see what was going on with her own sister. When Celestia sees them as a crush, a blossoming romance, they are already engaged. Celestia had not seen the years they fell in love with each other. All those times King Sombra visited them for royal talks, Celestia was surrounded by her duty, by her own kingdom. It is only when they go to the Crystal Empire, when those distractions are taken away, that she can finally see the way Luna looks at him. Luna has concealed their relationship up until that point, hiding their nighttime discussions through spells and enchantments. She knows how her sister feels, how her sister understands their duty. But she is younger, and Celestia would have noticed earlier, if not for her own failings. Now that she has noticed them, she prepares a grand speech, a reminder of the heavy crowns that she and Luna bear, their responsibilities to the world and their divine duty. Celestia believes that such a romance could not work for many reasons, and uses the reality of his relatively short life as a warning to Luna. But in so doing, she is pointing out to Luna's immortal life, her permanent separation from the mortals of their world, which is unintentionally the harshest thing of all. Besides feeling distant from her only real companion, her own sister, now Luna is reminded that she does not truly belong with anyone else, that she cannot truly be close with anyone else in the world, because they are so different in that important, fundamental way. Luna's divine duty, her heavy crown, holds her firmly on the throne. She might as well be chained to it. It is that cold realization that breaks Luna's spirit, so she concedes to Celestia's will and flies to tell Sombra. When she does, he is hurt just as much as she was. That's why the song is reflected in such a parallel in the verses and choruses. But Sombra can see through the tears and understands that it is not truly Luna making this decision. He knows it is Celestia whispering in her ear, but he also knows that he can't change her mind through words alone. He must transcend, become divine himself to bridge the gaps for the one he loves at any cost. Deep within the vaults of the Crystal Empire, there is one talisman that is rumored to do just that. The talisman was created by a dark wizard, and its origins are not truly understood. But that didn't matter to him. He would take the risk, thinking only he was the one at risk. Sombra cast the spell. Only after that did the true evils of the talisman become known. The talisman possessed him, causing his eyes to glow green like the jewel and erupt in the same purple fire. Dark spirits join him to chant the rest of the spell. The purple fire is an eternal flame. It can bestow eternal life, immortality, but the cost is the souls, the life force of all the crystal ponies Sombra has sworn to protect. Now he was no longer their king, but a being of shadows that had enslaved them in mind, body, and spirit. Once forming his dark onyx wings, he summons Luna again, through the same spell they had spoken with numerous times before. She arrives, and is at first filled with joy. All the hope floods into her again, and they talk about dreams for the future, the hope of sharing the darkness together. It was a promise that Luna would never be alone again. But then, Luna sees how the talisman has affected him. The shadows conceal a new evil that has taken root inside of him, and all at once, Luna sees their future falling apart again. So she leaves him behind, so that she can find an answer to the curse that has taken over his mind. This search means everything to her. It has given her a new drive, a way that she can finally bring their lives together. She is no longer folding to Celestia's will. Now they are kingdoms divided, split apart by their own desires and drives. In that song, all of them believe that what they are doing is right, that the others are blinded by their own arrogance and selfishness. In the choruses, you can see the same words being spoken from four different sides, Celestia, Luna, Sombra, 
and the spirit that now possesses him. The final chorus is sung by the Crystal Ponies. It is the split between those echoing the Shadow King and those who were able to escape. The evil spirit has turned Sombra into a slave as well. It uses Sombra's own desire for Luna and corrupts, turning it into a drive of control and dominance. He no longer wants to just prove himself to Celestia. He wants to defeat her and enslave her spirit like all the others. While that is happening far away, Luna locks herself in the library, searching for answers about this talisman, trying to find a way to set his mind free. Celestia finally sees this for herself, finally focuses on her sister and all the hurt that is inside of her. She is able to finally see past the distractions of her kingdom, if only for a moment, to see her sister consumed by her own struggles. But there is nothing she can say, because as much as she tries to relate to her sister, the divide between them is too great. She doesn't fully understand the complex emotions in Luna's heart. They stand apart, still hurt and separated, until reality comes crashing down. Crystal ponies show up on their doorstep. They enter the castle court having escaped King Sombra and his slave army. Those few who got away tell their story to Celestia and Luna, explain how bad things have become, and beg the princesses to save them. Luna is held under the spotlight, surrounded by a hundred voices of those learning the truth for the first time. There is nothing she can do, no other answer she could give. She's run out of time. If she can't save Sombra, her fiancé, her beloved, then she'll have to destroy him. She answers the calling, and the song ends with their army marching north to confront the Shadow King and free his enslaved ponies. They meet the army at the gates of the city, and the Crystal Ponies attack, fighting a battle against their own wills. Sombra and Celestia battle with words. She makes her own attempt to convince him to stop, but it is useless. His mind is already too far gone. When she sees him for herself, Luna mournfully agrees. She sides with her sister, and Sombra feels betrayed. The evil spirit inside of him uses that betrayal to cause him to lash out. Sombra battles with the Alicorns, a fight of the gods, as Heaven's Fury rains down on all of them. But in the end, he is only a shadow, an imitation of what godhood truly means. So before he can be defeated, Sombra casts a final spell, taking the Empire with him outside of space and time, where the sisters cannot get to him. Celestia and Luna find themselves alone, their army standing over a vast, empty tundra. The whole Crystal Empire had disappeared. The disappearance, an ending without a resolution, is possibly the worst outcome. Luna does not truly know what happened to him, where he is, or how much of him was left, if there was any part of the one she loved that the shadow hadn't consumed. That uncertainty slowly eats away at her, plunging her loneliness and isolation to a new level. While Celestia tries to comfort her sister, Sombra was just another villain to her, another tragic creature that they had to cast away in the name of Harmony. She does not truly understand the depths of Luna's suffering until eventually they manifest themselves and Nightmare Moon rises to take the world for herself. Only then did Celestia understand. Only then did it become personal. Only then did she see what her sister went through when Celestia found herself in the same situation. She had to fight someone she loved. This is how Moonrise and Fall of an Empire fit together. They are two parts of the same story, a story about how we are all constantly pulled apart by our responsibilities and desires. They are the same tragedy, the same struggles in life that we can all find ourselves in. They are about how we don't truly understand the struggles of others until they happen to us. The story is about not being consumed by either. Being consumed with desire, like Sombra, can cause so much hurt in others in ways that we might not understand until it's too late. Being consumed by our own responsibilities, like Celestia, 
can lead to isolation. You can find yourself separated from those around you and end up hurting the ones who loved you just the same. Which is why most of us find ourselves like Luna. We can become blinded by our own desires or we can become isolated by our duties. Usually we're successful and suffer at the hands of both of them. But despite all of that, Despite all the things that can go wrong in life, things that we let go wrong with our own decisions and missteps, the key is that there's always hope. There's always a way to turn things around if you fight for it, if you chase after it. And that's why I feel like even with a bittersweet ending like both Moonrise and Fall of an Empire have, there's always that chance for redemption and restoration. If you paid attention to the Fall of an Empire art, all of the drawings show King Sombra with that same talisman glowing just like his eyes, the possession of the evil spirit within. And if you remember from My Little Pony, that talisman is missing. That's because all you saw return was the talisman. The King Sombra we knew from Season 3, the reason in my headcanon in this story... He had so little apparent character, why he was only a shadow, why he was only a force weighing down on the souls of the crystal ponies is because that was the evil spirit. It had hijacked King Sombra, taken his likeness to rule over in his stead. And it is that hope that he might one day reappear that is so key to the final epilogue that when the last bits of the shadow's veil finally disappear, King Sombra may return once again in the sunlight, completely set free, back to himself once again. Because we can look at all of the problems, all of the bad things in life, but if you can't even imagine the possibility of hope, if you can't even hold on to that dream of something great that might come, that you might be able to work toward, then what's the point? That's why I try to maintain that sliver of hope, even with the most bittersweet of endings. So, that got pretty deep. But that's the kind of emotions, the kind of themes I was trying to play with while putting these together. Using references from the show and all the other material and backstory that exists out there, I tried to make something new out of it, something that would really connect with some of those emotions that all of us feel at one time or another. That's what I really love about writing. You can really dive into those complexities and feelings even beyond what gets written on the page. I wanted to explain all of this headcanon a bit, just in case that ends up being the end of the story. I know I definitely wouldn't mind doing a third part, wrap things up with a trilogy. There are a lot of other villains and characters that we could really dive into. Or even beyond pony stuff, there's a lot of cool things that we could do. A lot of other stories and ideas that we could play upon. I definitely would love the chance to work with the L-Train again. But I guess we'll just have to see what happens. Overall, doing the Symphonic Metal Operas was an incredible experience. I got to work with so many talented musicians and singers and artists. Everything else aside, just having these opportunities has made the whole Brony fandom totally worth it to me. And I'm really glad that people seem to enjoy the work we did. If nothing else, that's the biggest takeaway for anyone listening. Chase what you love. Don't let it go. Don't let it be lost or gone. Take advantage of whatever opportunities drop into your lap. Maybe your little six-song pony parody could become something much bigger and beyond what you could have ever hoped for. Fight for those dreams and enjoy all those times you find yourself at a crossroad of life. Thanks again to all the fans and all the listeners out there. Without your viewership and contributions, none of these things could have been possible. And here's to the future, to see what symphonic metal might be on the horizon. 